exposure to the natural magnets, which shows some uh, of them very spectacular properties, like for instance, so these uh, manganese bismuth tellurides, which are uh, newly discovered antiferromagnetic topological insulators, where well with, the, with the aid of ESA spectroscopy could provide interesting insights on the low temperature ground state and excitations and anisotropic spin dynamics and related to the peculiarities of the uh, non-trivial uh, electronic structure at the surface of these materials. But there are also other compounds which are interested, which show uh, different kinds of, um, of magnetic order. Uh, we, uh, we provide some evidence so that this very well-known material, chromium chloride, is a truly isotropic Heisenberg antiferromagnet, which is quite an exceptional case. On the other hand, for instance, so this nickel uh, phosphate, uh, <coughs> phosphosulfate, is an easy plane antiferromagnet with strong fluctuations. And finally, so, well, this um, very prominent material studied quite extensively in the recent past, uh, past so chromium germanium tellurite. So we provide uh, pertinent evidence so that it's a truly two dimensional ferromagnet with tunable anisotropy. And in my today's presentation, I will focus. Uh, on this material again, so my pointer doesn't work. So now, still not. What happened to it? No, it's not. Uh, <laughs> but it worked. Therefore, it should work again. Oh yeah, now it works. So <laughs> okay, so I will focus on this particular material. Uh, in the rest of my talk, and this brings me to the outline. First, of course, I will um, present some um, information about why these uh, materials are interested, why this emergent field of two-dimensional Van der Waals magnet attracts so much attention uh, in the recent years, and why electron spin resonance spectroscopy is a valuable tool to study uh, magnetic properties of these kind of um, uh, magnetic systems. And then I will focus on the uh, on this chromium germanium tool, right, which as we argue, is a ferromagnetic, a truly ferromagnetic two-dimensional material, even in the bulk limit. And so I will produce, um, present you some evidence on the spin dynamics and paramagnetic and oral states, and how could we very accurately uh, characterize and quantify the magnetic anisotropy and provide evidence for intrinsic two-dimensional ferromagnetism in this material, and how this is related to the theoretical prediction uh, which we attempted to make. And finally, so I will show so that one can control this magnetic anisotropy and tune it by applying a hydrost hydrostatic pressure. And so I will end my talk with some conclusions and uh, possible outlook. So my collaborators on this project are a team of experimentalists uh, from EFW Dresden, around Der Büchner and myself. So in particular, valuable were contributions by my former PhD student, Julian Seisner, and a Syrian scientist uh, in my group, Alexei Alfonsov. And so the, the crystals were grown by Asai Aswartam and Sebastian Zelter. And with the pressure-dependent experiments, so we were relied on our collaboration with the Kobe University, with the group of uh, Hitoshi Ota. And uh, on the theory side, so the group around Jeroen van den Brink in our institute was very helpful. Uh, so actually, so the emergent field of two-dimensional Van der Waals magnet <coughs> is not very old, so it's about, say, maybe uh, five years old. So actually, many of these materials uh, were known for already a long time. So they are magnets, some of them are ferromagnets and antiferromagnets. But then there was a re <coughs> renewed interest in them uh, regarding uh, both um, fundamental aspects of magnetic order in two dimensions, but also possible functionalities of these kind of materials in some advanced technologies, like for instance in spintronic applications. And the reason for that is that these are Van der Waals materials, so that means they're easily cleavable, and one can, with not so much effort, achieve a single or few layer uh, uh, two-dimensional magnetic system, which is very flexible in terms of changing its properties. For instance, depending on the chemical composition or some external, uh, external uh, stimulus, like, for instance, strain or pressure, one can change the spin Hamiltonian from truly Heisenberg isotropic spin Hamiltonian to Ising one or to XY one. One, in principle, can think of doping of these uh, one-dimensional or two-dimensional layers by uh, electrical gating, 
And that provides a long and possible and really interesting functionalities of this system. And there were a lot of, say, very influential arti uh, articles in, uh, in the recent literature <coughs> on that point. But uh, actually, so the most important property of this uh, single layer should be that it should retain a magnetic order. And this is the greatest mm -hmm. problem because it somehow it confronts so the, mm, the, the, the very famous uh, merman wagner theory uh, rigorously proved in the middle of the last century that at any non-zero temperature, one or two-dimensional isotropic spin Heisenberg model can be neither ferromagnetic nor antiferromagnetic. That means as soon as you increase the temperature above the absolute zero, so the low energy spin waves will be excited in the system, which needs an infinitesimally small energy to get excited, and the long range order uh, will be destroyed in two dimensional limit. And this is um, uh, easily to understand, for instance, if one considers the Heisenberg Hamiltonian, where all components of the spins, interacting spins, x, x, y, y, z, z, are coupled by the same exchange constant. And if one calculates so the uh, excitation energy spectrum of this kind of the system, then one can see so this, uh, one can obtain so this um, uh, dispersion relation between the energy of the excitation and the wave vector. And one sees so that for long wave excitations characterized with a very small uh, wave vector k, so the energy needed to excite a spin wave is infinitely small. And that means so that the two-dimensional layer uh, cannot have a long-range order, and so the spin will fluctuate from different directions in the case when the, uh, the, the system is truly isotropic. The situation may change drastically if one introduces anisotropy. And so this anisotropy is this parameter uh, lambda, and uh, in this case, the energy spectrum acquires a gap which is proportional to lambda. So that means if one switches on the positive anisotropy, one can stabilize a two-dimensional ferromagnetic order in the system because one opens a gap in the excitation spectrum which is proportional uh, to this anisotropy. If the gap is, uh, so then one has so this uh, full order of the spins in two dimension. If one closes this gap, the order is destroyed. So, and now, so that brings me to the uh, um, uh, electron spin resonance because actually it turns out so that exactly this method is very sensitive to this kind of anisotropies. And if one considers so the general effective Hamiltonian, uh, which is used in ESR spectroscopy, uh, one can see so that the ESR response is sensitive to many kind of interactions, the crystal field, spin orbital coupling, interaction with electron spins with nuclear spins, the Zeeman coupling, and on the right hand side, one sees so these uh, terms of the Heisenberg exchange and the anisotropic exchange. And very importantly is that the ESR response is in particular very sensitive to the anisotropies. So because the anisotropies, this gives rise to the finite width of the ESR signal and to a shift of the resonance position of the ESR signals in, uh, in, uh, in, in a spin system. So actually, so the principle of uh, electron spin resonance spectroscopy is very simple. If one has a uh, spin one half, spi uh, 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 spin one half particle, so in the zero field, the two possible energy states are degenerate, spin plus one half and minus one half. One applies uh, an external magnetic fields and one splits so these two states according to the uh, Zeeman effect. And if one shines an electromagnetic radiation of appropriate energy, uh, which meets so the gap between these two split states, so the electron spin, spin system will um, absorb the energy and will give rise to a resonance signal. One can change the excitation frequency, one can change the excitation frequency and uh, correspondingly so the resonant field will be changed. And if one plots so the resonant field on this frequency versus uh, magnetic field diagram, so one will obtain a straight line um, uh, originated from this origin and the slope of this line is determined by the g-factor. G-factor is a very important spectroscopic quantity. It's fundamental because it relates the angular momentum of a quasi-particle with its magnetic moment. So and actually in our lab, we can change so the excitation frequency uh, by two orders of magnitude from 10 gigahertz to almost one terahertz, which corresponds to the energies of from 14 microelectron volts to almost four millielectron volts. And this is the irrelevant energy scale for looking for spin waves. <coughs> 
Now, in case if the system is more complex, for instance, it has some anisotropy, so also the ESR response gets a bit more complicated. Uh, so in that case, so even in the absence of the magnetic field, some particular spin states have lower energies than the others, and this corresponds to the opening of some anisotropy gap, and the ESR responses get more complex, so instead of a single line, one in this particular case observed the two lines, and if one measures so this uh, signals at different frequencies, one obtains two resonant branches, and if one approximates uh, them to the zero magnetic field, one directly obtains the, the excitation energy um, or in the spin system. So now, in the case of the ferromagnetic resonance, and that will be a subject of uh, my today presentation, so in principle, in one sublattice ferromagnet, one can excite by ESR two, ex uh, two modes. So they are degenerate uh, at zero magnetic field, and so they have finite energy in the case of the easy axis anisotropy, so that means the magnetization or the spins, they want to stay, prefer to stay out of the plane. And in this case, one mode, if one applies the field uh, normal to the plane, it will develop uh, linearly with magnetic field. The other mode will first soften, and then it also will develop uh, linearly in the magnetic field. And this is uh, 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 distinct from the paramagnetic resonance, which is shown, the branch is shown here. If we have an easy plane uh, ferromagnet, so that means the spins prefer to lie in the plane for whatever reason. So then these two modes are gapless in zero field. So they develop a Zeeman gap with increase in the field if we apply it for both direction. Uh, and this is a specific, uh, very, very clear cut difference between the easy axis and uh, easy plane uh, ferromagnet. So now uh, let's come to this particular material, so chromium germanium tel telluride. So as many other uh, Van der Waals mm, uh, systems, so they actually uh, uh, present a structure very typical. So this is the chromium. Uh, uh, iron, uh, six-fold coordinated by, uh, by uh, tellur, uh, uh, tellur ligands, and they form a honeycomb lattice in the AB plane, and uh, these honeycomb planes are stacked along the C direction, and they're coupled on only very weakly uh, by the Van der Waals forces. And that this material is ferromagnet was known a long time ago. But recently, that was a really interesting work, um, published in 2017 by Chen Gong and uh, co-authors, who showed so that actually, so this ferromagnetic order present in the bulk, so this is the magnetization of the bulk material at 60, say, 5 Kelvin, something like this, is still present if one reduces the thickness of the crystal. Uh, and uh, the evidence came from the magnetic Kerr effect. So actually, so this is the magnetization of the five layer, four layer, three layer, and bilayer system, which still have a robust uh, ferromagnetic magnetization. So they couldn't measure the single layer because it was very unstable, but at least in the bilayer element, so the, f the, 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 the system retains ferromagnetic order. And then there's a very important question. What stabilizes the ferromagnetic order in this material? And then insights on magnetic anisotropy uh, were required, and so we attempted to uh, obtain them in our measurements. So for that, so we have grown so high quality single crystals of this material, so they are very flat and they're very chemically homogeneous, and we could confirm so that indeed so in the magnetization measurement they show a clear cut transition to the ferromagnetically ordered state with a Curie temperature of 66 Tesla, uh, Kelvin, sorry. Uh, and the magnetization curves are very similar for the in-plane and out-of-plane direction, uh, suggesting so that it's a very soft ferromagnet. So now if we measure electron spin resonance in the paramagnetic state far above the phase transition, so then we can measure them at different frequency and the uh, response is very isotropic. So the very sharp resonance lines and so the slope of the frequency magnetic field dependence uh, gives us uh, the G factor value and it's almost uh, very close to the spin-only value, which is expected for the chromium 3 plus ions because they don't have an orbital momentum in the ground state. So, however, there was a, uh, a first surprise that as soon as we lower the temperature below 120 Kelvin, so this response get ions progressively anisotropic. So the resonant field for the out-of-play direction, so it goes one, direct, uh, one way, and the resonant field for the in-play direction, it goes the other way. So actually, so this is a signature of the development of the spin-spin correlations. Low energy, low frequency spin-spin correlations which generate quasi-static local 
fields on the ESR time scale. But importantly, so these shifts, they are present or start to develop at temperatures which is twice as large as the ordering temperature. This is very unusual for a conventional three-dimensional <laughs> magnet, where as soon as the correlations start to develop in all three dimensions, the magnetic order sets in. And that was the first uh, indication that even in the bulk crystal, so we're studying a bulk crystal, so we see short-range two-dimensional correlations at uh, temperatures far, abo uh, far above the ordering temperature. So the next evidence, though, that this material is uh, truly intrinsically low-dimensional, even in the bulk limit, is the angular dependence of the ESR line width. So the ESR line width is given by the inosotropic dipole-dipole interactions, and therefore the width is uh, determined, mm, is somehow affected uh, by the relative direction of the uh, applied magnetic field and some symmetry axis of the interacting spin system. And in the paramagnetic limit, actually, so the ESR response is, um, uh, so ESR response is given by the spin correlation function, self-correlations function. So uh, it's time dependence. And usually in the paramagnetic limit of a three-dimensional system, so the spin correlation function is decayed very rapidly on the time scale of the isotropic exchange interaction. But in the two dimensions, in the two dimensions, there is a long tail of so-called diffusive tail of the spin-spin correlation where the long wave correlations, so they survive at times much, much uh, longer than this characteristic scale of the isotropic exchange interaction. And uh, in the limit of the short time scale, so all kind of dipole-dipole interactions, they contribute to the line width, so they call secular and non-secular terms, uh, and they give rise to a very specific cosine square plus one angular dependence we indeed observe at room temperature. However, in the 2D limit, so where this diffusive tail is prominent, so only one part, the so-called secular part of the dipole-dipole interaction is present and survives, and it is, uh, has a very distinct angular dependence. This is three cosine uh, square minus one. So one uh, has no more a minimum, a, a minimum and a maximum in these extreme directions of the fields, but it has a minimum of the so-called minimum of the so-called magic an angle of uh, 44, uh, 54 Kelvin. And so this is, was the second evidence that chromium germanium fluoride is intrinsic to dimensional ferromagnet in the bulk limit. So now if we enter the magnetically ordered state, indeed what we observe, so that the paramagnetic mode is now split in two ferromagnetic modes, suggesting that indeed so we're dealing with the easy access ferromagnet. So now you can see so that one of the branches, it has a finite offset here, and the other one is softens as a certain critical tilt. And if one measures the angle of dependence, one clearly observes so that at different frequencies, so there is a clear-cut angle of dependence. Here one has to, mm, mention um, uh, a difference between the electrospin resonance and ferromagnetic resonance. In electrospin resonance, so one measures the response of the individual processing spins. So they could be uh, coupled by exchange interaction, but nevertheless, there is a response of the individual spins. In a ferromagnetic resonance, this is a response of the total magnetization of the sample. So the magnetization processes around the uh, the around the applied magnetic field, and one can change these oscillations by applying a microwave radiation of an uh, appropriate frequency. And we could model so this uh, development of this ferromagnetic resonance modes by calculating the oscillations of this, magnetic, uh, of this uh, magnetization vector, which are given by the uh, angular derivatives of the free energy. And the free energy is composed of three terms, so this is the Zeeman energy, the intrinsic magnetic crystalline anisotropy, and also the so-called shape factor, uh, which um, uh, um, due to the specific shape of the signal, the plate-like shape. And so we could, from this we can accurately calculate the magnetic anisotropy energy, uh, which corresponds to about 83 microelectrons per formula unit, and the sign is positive, so that means it's definitely it's easy access what is required for the stabilization of magnetic order in the uh, single layer limit. So how reasonable is, uh, is this number? So that the theory helped us in this context. So our theory collects perform some uh, density functional calculations using all electron full potential local orbital code, generalized gradient approximation, and also what was important to add the correlation energy U. One important findings in this um, uh, computational study was the band structure. It turns out so that uh, the, uh, the conduction band, in this case, so it's gapped because it's a semiconductor, uh, but it is fully polarized. 
at low energies. Uh, it's one has, so here, uh, almost full minority spin polarization. Let's suggest that, if, for instance, one single layer could be gated and doped by electrons, so this will generate a fully polarized electron gas, which is very useful for the potential functionality of this material. Next uh, finding was that actually it was really very necessary to add the correlation energy between the electrons because in its absence, so the calculated magnetic anisotropy was of the easy play, which contradicted the experiment. However, increasing U up to say two electron volts and quite a good number, uh, so one could really uh, find a very uh, good match between experimental findings and the theory, uh, suggesting so that actually so uh, we have a reasonable description uh, of a single layer system in terms of the single ion anisotropy and polarization of the electron bands. So now the final question which was interested to us, how can we change so this magnetic anisotropy? Because it would be important to have some handle uh, which could enable us to tune these very important magnetic properties. One would be, uh, one possibility would be to apply pressure, hydrostatic pressure. In that case, so we, could, we thought, we could see that by changing the properties of the ferromagnetic resonance. In the absence of pressure, so we have these two excitation modes which are, uh, have different energies due to the magnetic anisotropy. If, for instance, we increase the pressure, it might happen so that the anisotropy gets smaller and therefore these modes would merge into a single line and eventually so we possibly could even turn the type of the magnetic anisotropy from easy axis to the easy plane. And indeed it uh, was realized in our experiment and this is, for instance, so a ferromagnetic resonance line at a given frequency uh, at ambient pressure. Now we apply a pressure and you see so that the line continuously shifts uh, to higher fields. So there is a distinct effect, a uh, very appreciable effect of pressure. So if we measure that at different frequencies, what we see is that this branch, so indeed, so with increasing pressure, it continuously uh, comes to the isotropic limit and we will see so these are two distinct branches um, at zero pressure and this is they merge into a single isotropic resonance response um, uh, by increasing the pressure. So in fact so it turns out so that we can close with pressure we can close the magnum gap. So we get an isotropic limit. Of course that was a question so what is the reason for that? It might be so that the, with the pressure we simply suppress ferromagnetic order or that reduce the magnetization. For that, so we made the um, uh, static magnetization measurements under pressure and we found that up to the critical pressure for the closing of the gap of 2.4 gigapascal, so still the ferromagnetic order is present in the bulk limit uh, and the magnetization doesn't change substantially. So that means we indeed we reach the isotropic limit by changing the intrinsic magnetic crystalline anisotropy so that it's fully compensated now by this uh, shape anisotropy which is always in play. So, and now, of course, so that is, uh, it's again doesn't work. <laughs> no? Yes. So, that means, so we have a handle. So, in the absence of the uh, applied pressure, so we have a gap and we have potentially in one dimension, in, in the single layer limit, uh, still a ferromagnetic order. But as soon as we apply a pressure, we close the gap and the order is destroyed. And so, we can think of some potential potentially conce interesting conceptual device where we put, say, this uh, layer of chromium germanium telluride on a piezo substrate and uh, if the substrate is unstrained, so then we would have an, uh, the time independent outer plane of magnetization of the single layer. As soon as we apply a voltage to the substrate, we contract uh, the layer and so the magnetization is lost. We can apply a new pulse and it goes like this. And so this is an interesting potential functionality. We can integrate so this kind of uh, B layer into some spintronic device, for instance, to generate spin dependent currents, uh, manipulate the spin dependent currents. So that brings it to the conclusions so that we can show that actually um, this material, uh, bulk crystals of this material still um, um, still show the properties of intrinsic two dimensional ferromagnet. Uh, which has an easy access magnetic anisotropy and we can accurately qu quantify uh, its value and show that it's uh, required um, uh, out of plane, so easy access anisotropy in good agreement between experiment and theory, uh, which also predicts so that if doped, so that we could have, have um, uh, 
almost fully spin polarized to uh, dimensional electron gas. And also, very importantly, we could find a way how to uh, tune the anisotropy in this material uh, by pressure. And we can propose that we could have in, uh, some strain control of magnetic ordering hazard structure. So thank you very much for your kind attention. Is it, uh, is it possible to say something about uh, exponents and how far it's from uh, really a transition from anisotropic to dimensional anisotropic ferromagnet to uh, isotropic ferromagnet? In terms of critical exponents, uh, actually, so the critical exponents, so that, mm, that would imply measurements I, I, in, in the case of ESA spectroscopy of uh, this critical exponent, should be, uh, should manifest, for instance, in the broadening of the ESR line. So because so the ESR line is a measure of the correlations. Uh, but unfortunately, so in these particular experiments, we, we, we couldn't do that. Uh, so because uh, of the technical uh, complications. So uh, as soon as we apply pressure in the pressure cell, so we have some, mm, some unwanted distortions of the ESR line. Therefore, we could reliably determine the resonant field. That's not a question. But the line shape is distorted, and therefore, so the determination of the width is getting problematic. So we didn't attempt to do that. Thank you for the nice talk. Um, a question about this intrinsic two-dimensional ferromagnetism in this material, mm -hmm. il bulk. Uh, when you say this, do you mean that each individual chromium layer behaves in a such way as if the adjacent layer did not exist? Almost. Almost. <laughs> because Almost. because uh, it does exist eventually, because otherwise you wouldn't have an, um, I, I don't think so, so otherwise I would say so that uh, you wouldn't have such high Curie temperature uh, as it is. And then it yeah. drops when you go it, thinner. Yeah, because it reduces. So this uh, work shows that, it, not our, but this uh, work on the, um, uh, few layer systems, so they show that it's reduced. But it's reduced due to the, let's say, reduced uh, dimensionality or because the anisotropy weakens as well? Uh, this is not clear. So that p possibly the, these are both effects. Uh, is it possible to measure flakes with your technique? Uh, not in this pressure experiment. So, unfortunately. So because this pressure, the pressure cell reduces the sensitivity by orders of magnitude. Because so you have a tiny sample in the very big uh, pressure cell, mm -hmm. which you have to expose to the radiation, so the density of the microwave radiation is really very uh, small uh, at the sample. I see. Yeah. Would be interesting anyway to do so somehow. So we will try to, we are going to try that in the strain samples, not the, iso not the um, uh, isostatic pressure conditions, but on the strain conditions. So this is what we plan to do. Of course, so, so well, well, we are not only ones who, who are interested in this material. Uh, well, you see, so this is, of course, a complementary study. First insights into the presence of an isotropy that came from the static magnetization measure. But as you sh have shown you, so these um, this magnetization curves are, um, are, are very similar for the in-plane and out-of-plane direction because it's a soft ferromagnet. And therefore, really to get to quantify the isotropy, you, you have to, to look at the spin waves. An alternative approach, of course, uh, that would be, for instance, the inelastic neutral scattering, uh, which so far I don't think that it was, uh, the elastic scattering was made on this system, but inelastic was not. Uh, but the problem of the inelastic, uh, uh, in, inelastic neutral scattering, uh, it's a very good method, so there's no question. But it has some problems of the energy resolution for small Q vectors. Because the, inten uh, well, so the intensity of the signal goes down, and so there is some instrumental resolution uh, issues. And therefore, if one wants to look for long wave spin excitation, so that the ESR, which doesn't have problem with it, 
So it's a, it's a more sensitive and more precise method. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, I think we needed to end uh, this interesting report. And um, 